All right. So this is the thesis proposal defense for GUA. And please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to my PhD thesis proposal. Uh, my research topic is about electrophysiological uh, heart model for assisting left atrium arrhythmia ablation. Let me start with an introduction of atrial arrhythmia and our heart model. Uh, we have healthy hearts and diseased hearts. The main difference is, is about heartbeat rate. So if the heart beating is too fast, we have tachycardia. If beating is too slow, we have bradycardia. And for us, we focus on atrial tachycardia, which includes atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. So this is the entire heart. We have four chambers. We have the left and right atrium and the left and right ventricle. And our research is focused on the left atrium. Atrial fibrillation is a disease that causes irregular and rapid heartbeat. We can see that uh, this is a healthy heart. The activation has a specific sequence that the atriums will contract first and then the ventricle contracts. But with a diseased heart, for example, this one has atrial fibrillation, the activation waves are very irregular. It causes the heart to contract uh, also irregular and lose its efficiency of pumping the blood. Uh, some facts in the United States. So uh, it is estimated that we have we will have 12 million people have atrial fibrillation in 2030. And each year, there is more than 450,000 people diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. And it contributes about 160,000 deaths each year. The symptoms for atrial fibrillation can include chest pain, dizziness, fatigues, and others. Treatment for atrial fibrillation. So we usually have three kinds of treatments. We have medi medicines, uh, we can do surgeries, and then lifestyle management. And what we are focused on is on catheter ablation surgery. This is an example of catheter ablation. Uh, catheters are inserted to the left atrium. And this circular one is a methane catheter. It has the electrodes that can record in endocardium electrographs. And the other one is the ablation catheter. The tip of it can generate heat to kill disease cells to restore normal activation. This movie shows us at the beginning of the ablation surgery, you can see that the catheters are creating the left atrium geometry when it moves around the left atrium, like here. You see the geometry is creating. And in the, at the same time, the electrodes are recorded electrograms, which will be converted to different maps for diagnosis. And this movie shows the uh, operation room during ablation. You can see that this is the ablation catheter and it's applying radio frequencies to generate heat to kill cells. So behind the glass is where the physicians do their work. And here at the front, we have technicians operating all these equipments. So what can the current mapping system provide us. So the current mapping system, uh, the, the major and the most popular one is called Cato 3. So it can provide lots of maps. For example, here we are showing 
a voltage map. So voltage map is a map that transforms the electric ground's amplitude into a color. So if the amplitude is low, you have red. If the amplitude is high, then you have magenta. And red means scar because low amplitude. And magenta means healthy tissue. So in this example, uh, the physician is doing a pulmonary vein isolation. What does that mean is that uh, usually when patients have atrial fibrillation, there can be some abnormal activations coming that originated from the pulmonary veins. So what the physician needs to do is to play around the veins so that those activations wouldn't go into the atrium. So the voltage map here helps the physician to find is there a gap in the scars regions. So if there is a gap, then physician need to do ablation to seal the gap. So here is another type of map. It's called activation map. This is an example of how this activation map is generated. So for example, if we have an activation started at the center here, and then the, the activation waves propagate through the atrium. And we convert this activation sequence into a map, into a color map, where red represents the earliest activation location and blue represents the latest activation location. So what this can help physician is that if there is a source that the earliest activation site is not at the normal site, the normal site will be around the Buckland bundle. So if it's in somewhere else, then you will, you will ablate those places to stop that uh, abnormal activation. Uh, this is another map the mapping system can provide us. It's called a coherent map. And what this map is, it's showing you a movie of the activations. So you can see the white arrows uh, representing the activation waves. And the physician here is doing a line of ablations because he tries to stop activation waves coming from the right to the left. But with this adherent co coherent map, we can see that there is a leakage of the activation somewhere in the middle here. So knowing that, then we will do ablation here. We just saw that the current mapping system is very advanced. So why do we need a heart model? Because atrial fibrillation or arrhythmia is important. Yeah, we, we just know that millions of people have atrial fibrillation and there are hundreds of thousands of deaths each year. And ablation is typical. The procedure usually runs for six to eight hours and the electrograms can be noisy and recordings are not synchronous and there are many other problems too. Our heart model can assist ablation. For example, we can simulate whole atrium activation and we can process electrogram to identify arrhythmia sources so that uh, we can reduce procedure time and we can do a lot of other things too. This is what I'm going to show you in the following slides. So this is a comparison. So the top row shows what the mapping system can provide us, these three maps we just talked about. And then our part model can provide everything the mapping system provides, plus any additional custom maps for example, phase singularity intensity map, which is very useful to show the irregular activations of the atrial fibrillation. And additionally, we can do patient-specific whole atrium simulation. And based on these simulations, we can assess ablation by detecting the arrhythmia source locations and by suggesting some uh, ablation strategies. And the figure here, this red dot and these two red lines uh, is representing some uh, ablation decisions that we can 
come from our simulations. So how does our heart model work? This is our heart model's pipeline. So we started with clinical patient data, which includes the left atrium geometry and endocardium electrograms of many different places. Usually we have about 2000 sample locations. And all this will be fed into our heart model, uh, which is a set of differential equations. And then the local electrograms will be transformed process and converted into heart model parameters. So we will have a patient specific heart model. So this is an example of uh, the focal arrhythmia and rotor arrhythmia generated by our heart model. And these are all patient specific. So analyzing these simulations, we can help ablation. So this is the heart model pipeline. And more specifically, we develop our heart model for clinical use. In that sense, we need our heart model to be good, fast, and cheap. Good, we mean that uh, the heart model should be very accurate. For example, have less than 5% error. And it should run in real time. Otherwise, it's impractical in clinical settings. So it should be able to update its segments. And then cheap, we mean that we should utilize what's already available. For example, we utilize the our mapping system as the data source for our heart model. Let me present to you uh, our current achievements. So we have some publications and I'll talk about the contributions we have done. <clears throat> so currently we have uh, published five papers and we are working on the sixth one. And here I would like to uh, point out our PBME paper, the third one especially, uh, because PBME is a top journal. So we got into this TBME journal, which is ranked number three by Google Scholar and ranked number five by the uh, SJR in the biomedical engineering field. And also our article has been as selected as a feature article in this top journal. Here is a list of contributions. We have developed a heart model for left atrium arrhythmia ablation. And we validated our heart model with patient data. And we developed noise reduction methods on patient data. Uh, we quantify the fiber effects on activation patterns. We develop an easy and fast method for tuning the model parameters. And lastly, we are working on uh, quantifying the accuracy of our heart model. And this will be my proposed research. Um, I'm going to talk more about it at the end of this presentation. So the following slides, I'm going to talk about my research in three groups. So research group one, uh, I will talk about spatial and temporal issues with data acquisition. And research group two, I will talk about identify arrhythmia sources from noisy data. And research group three, I'm going to talk about a hard model for real-time clinical ablation assistance. So let's dive into research group one. So the problem we are trying to solve in this research group is the spatial and temporal issue with data acquisition. So here in my hand, I have a pantheric catheter. So this is actual size. So it's a pretty small catheter. And during the data acquisition process, this catheter is inserted into your left atrium. Uh, for example, like my, if my hand is the left atrium's endocardium, then this catheter is going to acquire uh, data region by region. So the physicians will manipulate this catheter to move it into different regions. 
this figure shows the electro samples of the first segment. And then sometime later, yeah, the physician make another sample. So it's all in a different location. So here, take a note that these two segments are recorded at different time. So that's why we have the temporal asynchronous problem. And then after a few minutes, usually three to eight minutes, we will have about uh, 1,000 to 2,000 sample points. And here we can see the spatial non-uniform uh, sampling issue. Like this region is sampled densely but some other regions are sampled as sparsely. So we, this, these are the two major problems we need to deal with in a data acquisition process. So what, what is a hard model and how do we fed patient data into it? Um, as I brief, briefly introduced before, the hard model is a set of differential equations and then it has uh, parameters that represents local tissue properties. So what the patient data is doing is that for different locations, we have the electric bound samples and we can process them, convert it into the parameters, the local parameters, so that when we run this simulation on the entire atrium, it will be patient specific everywhere. So this is uh, and illustration. So patients' electrical location, the electric grounds, and the left atrium 3D mesh geometries, they are all constants. And the geometry is converted into a partition grid for the computation, simulation computation. And this each black dot here is one electric ground. And we can process that one electric ground to get that locations tissue property converted into hard models parameters. And then we have to use a tuning process. So this is our tuning process. We implement an optimization uh, iterations to minimize the difference between our patient's data and our simulations output. So when this is minimized, then this process, tuning process is done. so that we can simulate patient-specific activations. So by doing so, we have uh, solved the problems of sample data has non-uniform spatial distribution and asynchronous uh, time sequence. Like we, we all combine them into one whole left atrium. Rahul, sorry, did you? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I have a, a question. I'm trying to understand what high spatial resolution means. And specifically, uh, when I think of MRI images of the heart, uh, high spatial resolution can be, I don't know, maybe it's relatively standard to have a one millimeter cube. Right. So here, I think yeah. you mean high spatial resolution relative to perhaps other uh, techniques that are measured based on electrodes. But that being said, when you have the electrophysiological heart model, you've written there as a, a differential equation, but you're probably going to discretize that with some resolution. And what I want to understand is what is the resolution with which you discretize and how is that relative to the resolution with which you measure so that you can actually so that I can understand at what resolution we're operating here. Yes, okay. So for patient data, the electro resolution is about two, two to five millimeters apart of each electro samples. And in our heart simulation, we have a resolution of about one millimeter apart. Actually it's like 0.67 or to one millimeter is a part of spatial resolution. So what we did is we taken this less uh, resolution patient data. When we grab those local uh, parameters, we are interpolating those parameters to a finer grid to our one millimeter resolution simulations. 
So that's the way we And that, that interpolation process, is it really interpolation or is it that by solving the equations? Yes, by, by solving the, t the tunings, by solving the optimization problem. Yes, you by solving the, the the differential equation, you get a you solve it at a finer degree, essentially. Right. Yes. Um, and the right hand side of your differential equation has some uh, Laplacians and gradients. I guess those are implemented over the meshes, and the fact yeah. that you have a sparser resolution doesn't affect it, or you or maybe you actually have analytical ways to compute it at the finer resolution. I guess. Well, like for these electro locations, we have, like, like for example, let's make the simplified. Let's say that we have 1,000 points of electro uh, samples and mm -hmm. we have a million coins in the hard model. Yes. Yep. What, what we did is from this 1,000 points, we are going to, like at, at the beginning, we are implementing yes. a simple linearist neighbor matching. So yep. for a small group of uh, voxels in the harm model is going to have the same local tissue property. Yes. So that's the starting point. And then we are going into the optimization loop in which every node is getting fine-tuned so that yes. the model generates the same activation as the uh, patient. Yes. Um, and my last question is, there are lots of electrophysiological hard models operating at very different uh, resolutions. I mean, some of them really begin at the level of the cells and the muscles, and some of them are just at the global electrophysiological activity. What I'm trying to understand is for the purpose of the ablation, at what resolution do you need a model in order to, to operate uh, adequately? Yes, we have uh, run experiments to determine that. And our criteria is that if our model's output is within 10% of the uh, very fine resolution, like the approximate of the ideal resolution, if it's within 10%, then we accept it. And what we found out is that with this one millimeter spacing, like such resolution, we get only 3% differences from, let's say, 0 0.001 millimeters of simulations. And having this one millimeter apart is going to run much faster when you have like 0 0.001 millimeters apart. So our resolution right. is within 3% of the ideal error. Okay, thank you. That clarifies a lot. Thank you very much. So let's uh, move on here. So let's look at some results from this validation. So we have patient data on the left. This is a patient map. Uh, this is the local division time map. And then we have a simulated map. And you can see that the colors are very similar, which means the simulation is very similar to the patient data. And this plot, uh, each blue dot, is the patient data versus simulation data. And we have a red line that's 45 degree here. And what this means, if all the blue dots are on this red line, then we have exactly 100% match. But we can see that the blue dots are very tightly scattered around this red line. That, that indicating our model's performance is quite good. And here is the performance for other patients. So it's in such a format that the left one is the patient data and the right one is the simulation. So here we are showing nine patients at this page. And we, we can see that they're all very similar. And this page, we are showing the other uh, six patients with different arrhythmias. What's the source? This this patient data that you're showing. Mm -hmm. um, what's the source of that? Uh, the that's so the mapping that you show. Yes, that the that's the it, it, that's called electroanatomical map. That's exported from the Cato three system. That is from physicians' uh, clinical data acquisitions. It's 
like during the ablation positions, usually we save several maps. And this is one of the maps they save. So it includes electric grounds of about 2,000 locations and uh, geometries mesh. Maybe you're going to show this, but when you look at these maps and you do these comparisons between the actual activation areas and the scar areas and things, if you look at the areas where like the activation starts versus where the scar is, is that error uniformly distributed across the different parts of the heart, or is there higher error, for example, in scarred areas versus the where the activation area starts, or how is that scarred. error distributed? How is that error distributed? Sorry. Uh, if if we are talking just about scar, yeah. then like for a healthy heart, there's no scar at all. Yeah. So scar is one of the major uh, arrhythmia sources for yeah. atrial fibrillation, and it will be different patient by patient. So it doesn't have any specific distribution. It's like a disease; it happens somewhere, then it's somewhere. So it, it's all different. Right, right, what I'm saying for your model, for example. Oh, right? for model. Right, yeah, for your model, is it more prone to have higher error depending oh, I on see, the tissue I see. quality, right? Yes, that that actually depends on the resolution of patient data. Yeah. Like if we have a scar region, uh, sparse, like we have a region that have sparse uh, samplings, then we might have less accurate like patient specific parameters for that. So that, that's related to the data, mm -hmm. like the data spatial distribution. Okay. But usually for around 1,000 electrodes scattered around the atrium, if, even if they are like eight millimeters apart, we, we can still capture it quite accurately because we have the optimization process mm -hmm. that we iteratively attune it to be more and more patient specific. So let's recap. Uh, this is the summary of research group one. So we are so trying to solve this problem. Uh, given spatially non-uniform sampling and temporally asynchronous electrograms, how can we capture accurate electroanatomical maps? Our solution is to transform the disjoint electric ground samples into local parameters of the heart model which can then provide a whole atrium patient-specific simulation. And for the performance, that two panels of uh, patient data validations, um, we have 95% accuracy for sinus rhythm maps, and we have 94% accuracy for tachycardia activation maps. So now let's dive into research group number two to identify arrhythmia sources from noisy data. So what noise are we talking about? So here I show a few examples, like the power supplies can have noise, usually 60 Hertz noise. And we have ventricle far field, a very classic noise because the ventricle is much more stronger than the atrium, so it can have a very large activation that's being recorded in the left atrium. So we need to remove that because that's not the atrium's activation. And bad electrodes, it happens sometimes. The one of the electrodes of the catheter just becomes like they're just broken during the procedure. And then poor electro tissue contact. This is actually a tricky one. Because, like, we can take a look at this pathway catheter. The left endocardium of the left atrium it is the, the geometry is it's not smooth at all. So, when you place the catheter, it's difficult to ensure that every electro is in contact with the endocardium tissue. And oftentimes, you can have twisted splines or crossing each other or floating in the middle. And this last one, direction dependency of bipolar, like it's not something wrong with it. It's just the nature of a bipolar setup. I'm going to talk about that. So let's go to 
uh, bad contact problems here. So uh, some electrodes may have bad contact with tissue and resulting in low or noisy recordings. The reason for that is the catheter's splines might twist and the atrium is beating. It's like you, you, it's hard to keep the same distance from it. And maybe the patient breathes and then things just shifts. So the way to deal with this is we can make an automatic program, which we constantly check the distance between the electrode and the endocardium. And then we can monitor the movements of the electrograms, uh, like, like movements of electrodes. Uh, if the electrode is moving too much in a very small time, then it's probably sliding through the tissues, but not recording at the same location. And then we can also do frequency analysis on the electrogram. Like if it's all high frequencies, probably that's very noisy. Probably that electro is just floating in the blood pool. It doesn't have any tissue content. So by doing so, we can automatically filter out the uh, electrodes that have bad recordings. So here I'm going to explain what is the direction dependency of bipolar electrode? Uh, in this figure, it shows an example of an activation wave that is parallel to the bipolar direction. And what happened is that uh, the bipolar is consists of two unipolars. And if the wave is coming perpendicular to that direction, then a unipolar two is going to record a delayed version of unipolar one. So when you do the subtraction to get a bipolar electrogram, you, you will have a strong signal. But however, if your activation wave direction is perpendicular to the bipolar orientation, then both electrodes is going to record the same electrogram. So when you subtract to get the bipolar, you'll get zero. So this is a problem. Why is that? Because clinically, Low electrograms, uh, low electrogram amplitudes are being interpreted as scar. So what if you have a zero recording from the bipolar, but just because the activation wave direction is perpendicular to it? So you couldn't say that that spot is a scar, right? So this can lead to a misunderstanding of tissue property and it can further lead to incorrect ablation decisions. So let's recap the voltage map here. So voltage map, you have low amplitude as red, high amplitude for healthy tissue as magenta, and the color in between is like a transition. And usually we will set the threshold, for example, 0 0.45 millivolts to make this map and then we are looking for the red areas because that's the detected scar. So the, the way to adjust for the direction dependency of bipolar electro, so we develop an algorithm for that. So we would for like this electro zero is a unipolar electro and we are going to grab the electrodes in its vicinity. And then we are going to create every possible combinations of bipolars. So bipolars is the subtraction of two unipolars. So in such a way that we pick the highest amplitude bipolar signal. So that one should be more or less aligned with the activation uh, wave direction. So in such a way, we can correct some of the bipolar amplitude errors. So how does that perform in real data? Here, the blue is the original bipolar voltage. We sorted it, so it's from high to low. And then below a certain threshold like this, blue circle area, that's going to be identified as scar. And this red 
lines are the corrected values for that location. So we can see that after implementing this algorithm, there were many of the locations that was misinterpreted as scar, but it should be healthy tissue. So it's going to be corrected after the algorithm. And this is a vision of the voltage map showing like before correction and after correction. So before correction, we have this region identified as scar, but actually it is not, and it's being corrected. So this is showing the data interpolation issue. Like for regions where we have sparse uh, electron samples, when we do the interpolation, we might end up with some errors. And what we implement here is a Gaussian process regression interpolation. So this Gaussian process is going to uh, wait, it's going to take into consideration of its neighboring nodes to create an interpolation. So what, what it does is that it might correct some uh, local errors. Like there are three spots that is uh, interpolated as low values. But after this Gaussian process, it moves out to be a healthy tissue. And this makes more sense because like in reality, very small, places scattered and being like small scars is rare. So after the correction, it becomes more accurate. So to implement all these noise reduction methods, we run the project that we are trying to find a voltage threshold for issue population maps. So this is the uh, overall process. So first, we will process a patient's sinus rhythm map because sinus rhythm is very regular. We can get an accurate voltage map and we have an established threshold for that. So we apply that threshold to get a scar region which will be treated as the true scar. Then we transfer this region to atrial fibrillation maps. So here, let me explain a little bit more. So we have one patient and we acquire two maps. You know, on the same left atrium, we have a sinus rhythm map. And then the physician makes another map when the atrium is in a atrial fibrillation state. So it's the same atrium, but because it is two different maps, that's why the atrium looks a little bit different. But it, it doesn't matter too much because we can transfer that. So now we have a true scar region for the atrial fibrillation. And then we're going to adjust a voltage threshold on the atrial fibrillation map. So when we change the threshold, we will get a detected scar region. So what we're trying to do here is trying to maximize the overlap of the detected one, detected scar and the true scar. Try to maximize this overlap. So this is the- uh, Sorry, uh, how do you know which one is the true scar? Uh, from sinus rhythm. So we, we assume the voltage map coming from sinus rhythm with the established threshold to be true scar. And sorry, then I missed how the detection operates then. And, uh, uh, and, and then is the detection, is there a detection method that is being modified in order to match the, the true scar or not? Uh, well, so on the atrial fibrillation map, we have the electrograms and then we can set a voltage threshold so that it would detect a scar region on the atrial fibrillation map. So that's what we call the detected scar region. But since there is not an established voltage threshold for atrial fibrillation map, so what we do is we change that threshold. So each time we change the threshold, we get a new detected scar region. And then we compare it with the true scar region, which is transferred from the sinus rhythm map. 
So, so the have... only the only parameter being modified then is the is threshold. The threshold. Um, and is that enough? Namely, um, okay. If if I were to compare it with maybe modern techniques that are based on machine learning, you know, one has some detection or segmentation network that produces arbitrary regions over a mesh. And then you sort of train it to match the true uh, region. So in this case, um, why a, a detection with a single parameter is sufficiently effective for this problem? It's actually not efficient or not. It's actually a setup that's required by the physician. It's for clinical purpose. Because where, uh, physicians, they like just one value to put in their system to detect the scars. So of, of course, if we allow like a, a range or even like a nonlinear mapping, we can get a much more accurate uh, scar. But it, it's not, it's less practical clinically. So that's why uh, we are not doing it that way because this is uh, set up for clinical use. So we are trying to just get one single value, the threshold value that can be put into the cuttle system as a threshold to change the color of that voltage map. Um, I mean, I agree with that, but the, the question is thresholding what? Oh, thresholding of... And so the function of, that is being thresholded could be simple or could be very sophisticated and if you have a more sophisticated function, then when you threshold it, you're gonna get a more accurate estimation. So what is the function to which you apply the threshold in order to produce a detection and how is that function uh, computed or learned? So it's more like a data set than a function. So what we are thresholding is, if you can see the small blue dots, those are the electrical recordings. So each blue dot contains 2.5 seconds of electrogram, and we take the peak to peak voltage. So each blue dot, we have one data, that's the voltage value. And we are thresholding that voltage value. So, and then there is the uh, bipolar dependency correction and the Gaussian process interpolation in correction so that the blue dots of the sample data is represented on the more dense atrium mesh. So it's like for every vertex of this triangular mesh, we have one value. So we have a set of data, but then we are going to transform this set of an, an array of data into color by setting like if the value is greater than 0.45 millivolts, that's going to be magenta color. And if less than 0.45 millivolts, we assign uh, blue, green, up to red. So it's a, it's a simple uh, stretch holding for an array of data. Okay, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll ask you offline because there is something I still don't understand, but we can discuss it later. Uh, yes. So this is a performance comparison plot. What we are showing here is uh, the dash lines are without the two kinds of noise reduction uh, methods and the solid lines are the results when we apply when we implement this to two kinds of noise reduction methods so we see a sensitivity improvement by about eight percent and specificity improvement by about 0.3 percent so let's recap this research group too we are trying to solve this problem Given noisy maps, how can we identify arrhythmia sources? So in particular, the research we showed is the scar regions. That's one important arrhythmia sources. And our solution is we develop and implement noise reduction methods. For performance, we have improved sensitivity by about 8% and improved specificity about 3%. And this is tested on seven patient data.
So now let's go into our research group three. A hard model for real time clinical ablation assistance. So, all the research above is about data processing. And this research now, we are going to go into more details of the hard model and how we can build it into a running fast and for real time clinical use. So what we mean by real-time clinical, so to, to create a patient-specific heart model, we require accurate model parameters. But some parameters are not available for live patients. For example, fiber data. So there's, currently, there's no way to have high-resolution fiber data for real patient. So what we need to do is develop methods to compensate for the lack of some parameters. And specifically, we're going to talk about how to compensate for the lack of fiber data. And lastly, we're going to talk about how to make our heart model fast and easy to implement. Here we show the experiment set up for investigating the effect of fibers. So we want to know that how important are the fibers? Can we remove fibers and compensate for that? So this is the experiment for that. And what we are doing is we have seven X vivo left atrium with high resolution DTMRI fiber data. So each of them takes about 50 hours to scan. So that's why it is impractical for live patient. But we have this ex vivo data for seven patients. And what we do is we choose patient one's geometry, and then we register all other seven patients' fiber onto this geometry. And you can see that for the same region, the fibers are different because that's coming from different patients. Maybe you can just explain why fiber is important. All right. So why fiber is important? Because fiber activation uh, velocity along the fiber direction is usually two to five times faster if the activation wave is in the perpendicular direction of the fiber. So that might create a huge difference in the activation patterns. Now, if we have the same activation source that's coming from here and then spreads out, if we have different fiber, we might have very different activation patterns, but is it? This is what we are trying to figure out and how, how much of difference it is. So that's the experiment setup. This is myocardial fiber? Yes, myocardial fiber. And we simplify the fiber into two layers. So we have the endocardium fiber and epicardium fiber. So we register different fibers onto the same atrium. But then we, given the same simulation uh, initializations. So the same condition, the same way of generating the activation wave. And let's see how much of a difference are there with different fibers. The only different thing is the fiber. And uh, we can see that the differences are actually very small. So we are trying to look into more details uh, to find out why the differences are very small. We observe that fibers do have a local effect. And what's being shown here within this ori ori origin uh, circle is that you can see these red areas are different. So we have a broader air red area here. That means activation wave is traveling faster here. So bear in mind that these two atriums are simulating the same focal arrhythmia. The differences is only in, in fiber orientations. So because of the fiber orientation differences, we have these activation differences. And the reason behind that is, well, this uh, bottom one, the activation waves 
are parallel to the two layers of fibers. That's why it's much faster when, when it's like compared to when it's perpendicular to its direction. So we, we do observe this local effect. But if you zoom out and see the entire atrium, the overall differences are actually not that big. And why is that? So we look into more details. So this is a hypothetical activation wave that coming from one end to another end. And what happened is this activation wave is going to go through different regions. For some region, it's going to be perpendicular to the fiber, so the velocity will increase. But for some region, it's going to cross the uh, the wave is going to go across regions that are perpendicular to the fiber orientation. So overall, the conduction velocity, it can increase, decrease, and it makes the overall global speed doesn't change much. And why this happened, uh, it, it's the nature of left atrium fibers. So we analyzed the seven fiber data, we find that Fibers are very different patient from patient and region from region. So it doesn't have a strong organization as the ventricle. So we, we think that this result might not hold true for the ventricle because you have much more organized fiber orientations. But for the atrium, uh, it, it doesn't have that strong organization. This conduction speed calculation that you did, because these are ex vivo hearts, so obviously they're not alive and beating. And, but, right. But, and so it, was that based off of known literature in terms of how these fibers are conducting? And so you created that model based off of yes. prior work. Okay. So we set up hard models parameter yeah. so that the conduction velocity is about 0 0.7 meters per second, which is clinically observed. So we, we changed the parameters to match what is clinically observed. So if I understand correctly, these are results in simulation. Simulation, right. And again, elaborating on the, on the question that was just asked, it's not clear to me how the model was changed to accommodate the fibers. In particular, I think in the differential equations that you had several slides ago, there are some gradient calculations, don't those gradient calculations need to be modified based on sort of the local diffusion uh, tensor? And how was that taken into account? How is the fiber being used to do the simulations? Because if the simulator is not taking into account the fiber structure, then how do we know that the conclusions are right? Yes, let me answer the question. So as you said, the fiber orientation is going to be put into the hard models differential equations. So the fiber is going to be put into this diffusion tensor and it has a, uh, an isotropic ratio to define the speed ratio that along fiber and perpendicular to fiber. So yeah, but, but it, exactly my point is that this uh, D, it's now going to be a three by three matrix, right. I think. Yes. And that is now going to depend on space. And so I think one gets partial differential equations as opposed to just differential equations. And now when D is constant, that's easier. But when D changes, don't you need to solve more complex equations and, and, and also how do you get that D uh, in simulation? Like in, from real data, right? You can do diffusion tensor imaging to get the, the D. Uh, so that's what I'm not so sure. How, how is this being done? We choose a nominal D value, which will produce conduction velocity around 0 0.7 meters per second. So matches the clinically like a typical clinically observed value. So we, we, we set the diffusion coefficient the same everywhere for this experiment. But what about the orientation? So that it depends oh, on the fiber orientation. Coming, 
Yes, it, it orientation is coming from the DTMRI fiber data. So what that data okay. gives us is for every location, a uni 3D vector representing yeah. fiber orientation. So that's going to be inserted into that, that node's D matrix. So mm -hmm. for every node, we have a D matrix and we are inserted for that location's fiber data. And we have uh, endocardium and epicardium fiber data. Okay. And then the simulation involves solving a PDE? Yes, the simulation is going to solve these uh, differential equations in the Cartesian grids. It's, uh, we, I, I didn't prepare that for the slides, but it's computing on that like one millimeter space in Cartesian grids. And where this Cartesian grid is also being separated into two layers, one endocardium layer and one epicardium layer. So for endocardium layers, the voxels are assigned the endocardium fibers. And for the epicardium layers, mm -hmm. we assign the epicardium fibers. And then we solve them together by this diffusion. Okay. So this is the next question we work on, how to make our heart model fast and easy to implement. So we know that in order for the heart model to be used clinically, we need it to be patient specific. That means we need to tune it. So how can we make the tuning process fast and easy to operate for the physicians? So this is a method we developed and it requires only two electro sample points. So at the beginning of the procedure, the physician just needs to make two measurements that's far apart and two electrogram measurements. And these two electrograms is going to be put in to the model and process to obtain two local activation times. So we know that at what time the activation happens here and then at what time the activation happens there. So for this map, the activation is coming from point one to point two. So after the process, what we know is the time difference between these two points. And then we, we also know the distance so we can calculate and uh, get uh, estimated diffusion coefficients. So that will be a starting point of our model. And actually this starting point it's not bad at all. So here is some comparisons, like after just two points of tuning. And of course, this is also a simulation-based uh, research. So we can see that the true latest activation time regions uh, mark at red here. And then our two model generated uh, latest activation time regions are marked in blue and the greens are the overlap. So we, we have a pretty large overlap areas. And then for rotor uh, simulations, we can see this, the, the red dot representing the rotating center of the true model. And then the blue one is rotating center of the, the tune one. So they're not that far off. And what we can, to, to improve this model during the ablation is that the physicians is going to continuously record new data points. And with each data recorded, we can update the model to be more accurate. So in that way, we will have a real time a model for clinical use. Okay, I have something. So this is the uh, summary of uh, research group three. Uh, we develop a fiber independent heart model with parameters for real-time clinical assistance. 
and it can produce patient-specific focal and rotor arrhythmias. The tuning time is actually just 15 seconds on a personal laptop computer. So it's fast enough to be practical. That's both for focal and rotor? As just one. This is the, the tuning time. Like we, we have uh, two, exam two electro samples coming in, and then we tune the model to match that. Uh, we just need 15 seconds to do that. And every new data coming in, like we can wait for like another 100 new data, and then we can retune it. And that's all going to cost another 15 seconds. Because yeah. rotor arrhythmia mapping can take a long time clinically, you know, so that's why I was just curious. Yes. Right, that's actually in the proposed <laughs> research. And this is more talking about focal uh, tuning. So, I mean, do you, you present, you use the word fast and simple, right? Like, uh -huh. and so I'm thinking like, you know, when you present the thresholding problem, you have a single threshold, uh, which, and then in the fiber problem, you know, you, you have uh, this technique. Simple is good, but it might seem that you're, you know, oversimplifying the problem, right? So how can, can you argue that you're, you're not, are you oversimplifying the problem and, you know, maybe the problem is much more complex and, oh, okay. yeah, so it, it, it seems like, you know, you're saying, oh, oh, actually this is simple, I can solve it like this, but actually the problem is much more complex under the hood, especially for fiber. Right, right. It's true that the underlying problem is really complex. So the simple is in a sense of clinically available. So uh, like what? The, the reason we are developing a hard model without fiber data is because fiber data are not available. So that of course also brings in some errors in our patient-specific simulations, but we have a tuning process to compensate for that to reduce the error. And we get 95% and above accuracy uh, after doing that. Of course, it's also like in a, ideal setup, like we are comparing simulations to a ground truth simulation. So there's a lot less noise there. But like uh, in order for our hard model to be implemented clinically, we have to work with what's available. Like if something's not available, we have to simplify it. And how does this, any all of your results compare to the patient? data that you have. You have patient data for the thresholding problem, you have patient data for the fiber. Right. So for the uh, 15 patients, uh, we have eight patients having the sinus riddle map and we have uh, seven patients have tachycardia maps. So we validate our model there, we get around 95% accuracy in, in the sense of the heart model we're reproducing patients map like activation map. And here in the fiber independent heart model, we are like in the, in the voltage threshold, we are improve the sensitivity specificities by a few percent and mainly due to noise reduction that we implement. So now that's the uh, proposed research plan. So we, we just show that uh, we can develop a hard model for clinical use and we don't need fiber data for that. But then we, we haven't quantified the accuracy for that yet. So the proposed research is on quantifying the, the accuracy of our hard model. And this is the proposed experimental setup. And it's also simulation based. So we are going to have a fiber inclusive model, which we have the true fiber data. So we are going to work on the seven X vivo heart model, uh, seven X vivo left atrium with fiber data. So we plug in the fiber data, we generate focal and rotor arrhythmias, and this will be the ground truth. And then we remove the fiber but then we have a tune process to compensate for the fiber, which we get a fiber independent model. 
And for the same arrhythmia setup, we also run focal and rotor simulations. Then we can compare these two to quantify the differences. And that will be the accuracy of our fiber independent harm. So we have some preliminary results. So this first line here is seven focal arrhythmias on seven different atriums. So they have fibers included. So this is to mimic the real patient. And that's the ground truth. And the second row here is we are given the same initialization, the simulation initialization. So given the same, but just with no fibers and compensated for diffusions, we have a tune for that. And then this is what the fiber independent generates. So we can see there are some differences. And then we are going to compare and quantify that. So this last row is one way to compare these two. What we are looking at is the latest activation regions. And this region is obtained by saying what is the last five seconds of activation, like this small blue regions. And why, why this is meaningful is because like the activation wave started from the origin and then it's going to the latest activation locations. So if there are any errors, the errors accumulate the most at the latest activation locations. So that's why we're looking at this location. And we have red coming from the ground troop, and then we have blue coming from the fiber independent model. The green is the overlap. So our preliminary results show that it's performing pretty good. So this is for focal arrhythmia. We see the same for rotor arrhythmia. So we generate a ground truth rotor simulations on seven left atrium. And we generate another set of simulations on the fiber independent model. And then we are going to compare these two maps. So this is uh, showing the accuracy map in the third row. Blue means 100% accurate. Red means like about 30% accurate. So we can see that the majority of the regions, they are very accurate. They're very blue, very accurate. And for the low accuracy regions, it's actually these transition regions where early meets late. And we think that this um, is not going to produce too much of a problem because clinically for rotor arrhythmias, for example, macro reentries, it's important to identify the center of the rotation or the, these transition uh, areas. And our fiber independent model is able to do that. Okay. You're saying it's 30% uh, uh, percent or percent of what? Of the well, time. this is calculating the, like for each point. Yeah. That, that there is the same point in the two geometry because they're same geometry. Yeah. So for the same point, you have two values. Yeah. You calculate the differences yeah. and then you divide it by the uh, true value. So, so that, that gives you a percentage. That, that means the red regions are close to zero, right? The, the time. So your time, you're, you're dividing to a smaller value. Yes, that's, that's why you're getting some higher errors in these transition regions because you can see that for the region, like in this transitional region, small differences can result in very different values. Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying that why do you use this percentage as a, why don't you just use the absolute time of different error, error of time? Oh, we want to spatially display it. Like absolute time, yes, we can do that too. Uh, yes, we will consider that, uh, okay. maybe work on that. So this is some preliminary results. Oh, okay, I, I, I remember now. So, Usually a percentage is preferred than an absolute value because you, when you tell somebody you have absolute time differences of five milliseconds, then the question is, how accurate is that? I thought one millisecond is good. Or, oh, that's great. I thought a hundred milliseconds is like a blink of an eye. 
So that's why we, we, we do like a percentage thing. Yeah, I think I think if you do an average of the uh, then you can use a percentage. But but here if it's if you if you use a spatially distributed arrow, then you're dividing a different value. Like yes. if, if you're dividing through to a uh, dividing a smaller value, then sure you have a larger error. Yes, on, so, on, on average it's going to be yeah. above ninety percent. Our preliminary result shows that for the rotor map, like if you just average out this. The accuracy is about ninety four percent. Okay. Before you go to your next slides, and this is going to come. Well, there's two points I want to, I guess, bring up. One on your point about sort of the the centroid of the rotor being the most important. You know, the black dots right, that yes. you pointed out. I think that's important to highlight. I think because clinically, right, when I look at this map, I'm like, oh, the path, the transition point in the in the rotor arrhythmia. Is, is less accurate because I see, you know, your 30%, whatever accuracy, but you're telling me that actually, no, clinically, what all that matters is what is the accuracy around the black dots, yes, right? Right, right? So I, I do think that's important to highlight on the accuracy map, like where, where it is most clinically relevant or, or you pointed yeah, out yes, question, true, true. but it, it's important, I think, to clarify that. Yeah, we got um, to calculate the distances, distance yeah. differences, Yeah. right? The, the other thing that I'm still trying to wrap my mind around, I think, relates back to the, the, the prior line of questions that Renee and I were asking you, which is your ground truth uh -huh. is based off of the simulation right. that takes into account certain assumptions in the model. Right? right. And then you have your fiber independent model, which uses a lot of those same assumptions, right? Yes. But then replaces your information about fiber with some of the tuning parameters that, that you've calculated, right? To be the, to create this fiber independent model. Right. And so what I'm still trying to understand, and this is what's making it difficult for me to sort of phrase the question perhaps in an understandable way, is how much of a difference in this accuracy is is actually sort of a, a difference in the model versus this quote unquote ground truth, or is are you just measuring a difference in error in, in these two different simulation models that you've set up, right? Like how clinically relevant is this to me as a clinician, if I look at this and I say, no, this is the difference between two simulations, not the difference between an actual activation pattern yes. and, 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 and a simulated model. Because I guess I, 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 and maybe this relates back to what Renee was saying, which is how do I know that these are the parameters that are actually representative of fibers contribution to the activation map overall and, and how these arrhythmias are propagating um, when you've made certain decisions in setting up that model because you're using an ex vivo heart. Right. So this simulate simulation compares to simulation type of uh, research is going to give you a ballpark of the performance. And like at the uh, very beginning, we have working, we have work on patient data. Like we have worked on 15 patient data for validating the heart model. And we work on seven uh, patient data for the voltage map project. So that shows a more real yeah. number for accuracy and stuff. But here, why we use simulation is because like for clinical data, it's very limited. For one patient, you usually get, usually you would just get one useful map. So physician can make, can uh, save five maps, but you usually, the useful one is just one. Right. But in simulations, although I'm just showing like seven here, like for, for example, let me go up here. And although I'm just showing seven uh, focal simulations, but actually each of them, we created another file. So we have actually uh, comparing 42 different scenarios. Uh, if uh, we are working with patient data, then we just have one type of uh, vocal yeah. source. I guess, uh, my question would be, how does your fiber independent model compare to like real patient data? Uh, have you done that comparison or no? I know you won't have fiber inclusive for a live patient, obviously, because you can't. Right. Yes, data. yes. But if you take this model that you've developed, it's now fiber independent. So I guess that's patient. more like it's, it's more like uh, included into the first 15 patients validation there. So actually there we we, we have a diffusion tuning 
and we don't have fiber there. So actually that that is also a fiber independent model. Like we we say that we can produce, reproduce patient specific sinus map, patient specific tachycardia maps on 15 patients. Right. And that is a fiber independent model there. So, so the accuracy there is about 94%. So then is that model then the same as this fiber independent model or are these two models different? The the tuning has been improved. Right. So, so that, that, the, the, the first validation part is a few years back. Right. So we have uh, um, like less performance yeah. in the tuning. And the newest version, we have a better tuning process. So have you gone back and used this newer tuning process? I haven't done that. Okay. Um, but that also, like, when, whenever you deal with patient data, actually the pre-processing de like, determines your results mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah. You heard of that like in statistics, garbage yeah. in, garbage out. Yeah, yeah. So that's why in the, in the first section, I talk about a lot about uh, noise reduction. Yes. And it happens that many electric grounds, noisy electric grounds, when we ask the physician, they are not quite sure whether it's real, mm -hmm. like, the, fibrillation electrogram or just noise. Yeah. So it's, it's hard for that. And what we did is whenever we are not certain, we just excluded it. Yeah. <laughs> so in, in that way, they actually help us to get a better performance. But if we are running patient data, then that's really like the pre-processing step is really important. Mm -hmm. And Let's talk about uh, my thesis completion timeline. So the proposed research, I plan to finish it soon, like May the 5th. And we actually have a manuscript submitted already. It passed the first review, but we need to make revisions. So we are working on that. And the uh, advice that you just gave, we are going to incorporate it then, mm -hmm. like do more uh, different types of comparisons and matrix. And we, I, I would like to uh, do my thesis defense on mid May. Uh, and to recap, my overall research right now, I'm having these six contributions. So we have developed heart model for left atrium arrhythmia ablation. We validated our heart model with that 15 patient data. And we develop noise reduction methods on patient data. We quantify the fiber effect, and which we found out that fibers doesn't affect the activation pattern that much. So that confirms that we can, uh, we can develop a fiber independent model. And for that model to be clinically useful, it needs to be easy and fast. So we de developed that two point tuning method. And this is the proposed one. Uh, how to quantify the accuracy of our heart model. And uh, a recap of the publications I have so far. So I'm proposing this sixth one. Uh, thanks everyone for attending my PhD proposal meeting. <laughs> So we can have uh, more questions and then we can have uh, our own private discussion uh, after that. <laughs>